Good day, everyone, and welcome. We're excited that you've joined the COPC Recruiting and Hiring Practices That Work session, and it's great to have many of you here today. We hope that you and yours are well and safe. Uh, my name is James Camerari, Vice President of North American Sales at COPC, and I will serve as today's session host. I'd like to start by introducing my colleague and veteran COPC consultant that will be leading today's event, uh, Mrs. Cindy Edwards, Director of North American Consulting, who offers us 25 years of customer experience. Uh, customer experience as a customer experience professional has been with COPC for the last 15 years. Uh, she, she had, of course, as I've mentioned, she brings many years of experience on the client, on the outsource and on the consultancy sides of the industry and is also responsible for leading performance improvement and certification engagements and for the delivery of many of our best practice training classes. Uh, we are both glad to be with you today. As many of you are already familiar with COPC, I'll just take a quick moment to introduce our organization. Uh, so we won't spend a ton of time on this, but very quickly, I just want to let, share with you that we are a global consulting firm. We've been around since the mid nineties and we are relentlessly focused on creating meaningful customer experiences and optimizing business outcomes, as the slide says here. And we do this with a focus on performance improvement for operations that support the customer experience. We developed a performance management system and quality management framework known as the COPC customer experience standard, and we're, we'll be, uh, which covers uh, the best practices and CX operations for in-house, for outsourced, and for also for vendor management organizations. And many high performing organizations follow that standard or are compliant with it or even become certified to the standards. Uh, we have consultants in 19 countries and have conducted operational improvement engagements in more than 70 of them. To support all of this, our solutions include customer experience strategy consulting, optimization consulting, training and certification, all of course based on the COPC CX standard. Uh, and uh, just to give you a little bit of an example of these uh, directly related to today's recruitment and hiring topic, uh, we help our clients design their recruitment and hiring processes. We help them implement uh, these best practices, including development of hiring and uh, recruitment playbooks. Uh, we help them write uh, successful hiring profiles and applicant screening to help them minimize attrition. Uh, and we provide overall uh, strategic customer experience consulting in, in the area of recruitment and consulting. And of course, as mentioned before, we, we train their teams to help maintain uh, a, a lot of these best practices on their own uh, through many of the best practices training that you see here listed on the right-hand side of the slide. Okay, that's a little bit about COPC. A couple of uh, quick housekeeping items during the session. Uh, the attendees will be muted, but will be able to submit questions. So see the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little Q&A button down there. Uh, our, agen our agenda will include about a 10 to 15 minute session after the presentation in which to field your questions, uh, but you can submit them as we go. So I'll collect them and make sure Cindy has them for answering at the end of our session. Uh, we'll also uh, close out our session today with a short poll for feedback purposes. So if you would be so helpful to take a moment to respond to that as well. Okay, with that said, I'd like to hand it off to Cindy to get us started. Cindy? Great, thanks James. Appreciate it. Well, as we kick off this webinar, uh, this is one of my favorite topics, um, but I want to begin with the end in mind. Um, most organizations we talk to agree that their customer experience is their end goal and driving higher levels of customer satisfaction and reducing customer dissatisfaction and creating an easy and seamless journey for their customers. So thinking about that goal, we ask ourselves, what drives higher levels of customer experience? And from our experience and the analysis we have done, a key driver is accuracy. Doing things right the first time, having high levels of quality and performance and being accurate. Well, what do we, um, what do we need to deliver high levels of quality? Well, in a human assisted channel, we need the agents to be knowledgeable and provide the right answers to customer inquiries. And of course, we ask ourselves, how can we ensure our agents are knowledgeable? Well, that requires us to identify the minimum skills and knowledge required for that role and the training that role needs because we don't expect people we hire to have all the knowledge off the street, we have to train them. And to ensure the agents can learn this training material, we must have an effective recruiting approach. 
we will know how good a job we did in recruiting and training by reviewing the skills verification results. And we will know whether our agents are providing the right answers through our transaction monitoring process. And we'll be able to measure our customer's experience through CSAT surveys and customer effort scores. So starting with the end in mind leads us to the beginning, which is what we're gonna talk about today, which is recruiting and hiring. We have three key areas that we want to introduce. The purpose of recruiting and hiring, the effective recruiting and hiring approach, and how we evaluate success. So what's the purpose of recruiting and hiring? The purpose is to ensure the organization has a skilled and motivated workforce. Skilled means that those we hire can learn the training material and interface well with our customers. Motivated means that the candidate hired wants to work at our company and not just um, accepting the offer as a gateway to bigger and better things. They genuinely want to have a career path with our company. This is important because this can result in lower attrition and absenteeism. So to achieve this purpose, we must ensure our organization has a robust and consistent process for first defining the jobs and their minimum skills and knowledge. What skills and knowledge do each role require for success? And then identify who are the best candidates for that role. Once done, that profile per se is used by the recruiting staff to seek out candidates who meet those requirements. Um, if this is done well, the new hires will be able to successfully perform their jobs. High performing organizations build robust recruiting and hiring processes. They include defining each of the jobs and their associated minimum skills and knowledge requirements, which we're gonna show you an example of. Once the candidate profile has been determined, recruiting uses that information to determine from where to source these folks. Their goal is to attract candidates who can be skilled and motivated thus the right candidates for the job. Screening comes next. As candidates apply for the job, we need to ensure the results from the screening process are good predictors of future success with our company. And here we're going to talk um, about the proper screening tools and thresholds. Verification of our candidates begins with the very first interaction. Uh, reviewing their resume or CV, job history, and during a phone and, and video screen, and continues through the interview process. All along the way, verifying the candidate possesses the threshold levels deemed appropriate for their job. Lastly, the recruiting and hiring team needs to continually analyze the output of this process and be open to modifying not only the recruiting profile, but perhaps the process itself. If the data shows that our candidate sourcing is off or the screening process does not work, um, be sure to head back upstream to see if the, we define the jobs correctly. Depending on the frequency of hiring activity, our clients may conduct this analysis every six to 12 months. Defining the jobs is the first step. At a minimum, we recommend identify minimum skills and knowledge for these jobs. Agents, or those who interface with your customers. Supervisors, or those who directly manage the agents. Quality evaluators, or those who perform transaction monitoring. Trainers, those who would be training the agents or frontline staff. Workforce management staff, those involved in forecasting and planning and scheduling and, and even real-time activities, and those responsible for managing your content or knowledge base. For each of these, high-performance organizations have written definitions of the minimum skills and knowledge, and these are included on the job profile. The job description should provide candidates with what the job entails, including specific responsibilities, such as maybe education level and age and work experience. 
Um, competencies that are important to the organization should be identified and used during the process to define the minimum skills and knowledge. For example, we may want our candidates to have competent sales skills. If so, this would require specific skills such as listening for clues from the customer to identify a ripe sales opportunity. Once the jobs are defined, then we need to identify the minimum skills and knowledge for each of the jobs. Identify the minimum skills and knowledge required to do the job, distinguishing between those that are required and those that are nice to haves. Our easel pad shows that this organization determined their agents needed a high school diploma. They had to be 18 years old. They needed to have some customer service experience and the ability to resolve problems and others. These are all the minimum skills and knowledge this organization identified as must have skills. And staff hired into this role should not be allowed to perform their jobs unless they possess each of these at the required threshold level, either through recruiting or training or both. Once we identify the complete list of minimum skills and knowledge requirements for a position, we then must separate them between those required at the, time, at the time of hire and those the employee needs to have once they've completed training. As you can see, the skills to be hired also include things like capabilities and experience levels and characteristics. Um, these may be the ability to work evenings or weekends ensure they have reliable transportation, live within a certain distance from the office, have a certain education level. Um, skills to be trained are those needed to go into production and work with our customers. We can't possibly, as we said, hire folks off the street who already understand our company's customer service process without training them first. Whatever the organization deems to be needed to ensure a skilled and motivated workforce. This is recruiting's job. Now in our world today, we have a need for staff who can work from home. And the minimum skills and knowledge required for work at home staff is different than a traditional brick and mortar. In addition, some of the expectations work at home staff have is flexibility in how they work and when they work. Naturally, back in March, those traditional brick and mortar operations forced their people to move home and were then expected to perform well. We you may have found this to be an uncomfortable time for many. Staff being forced to work from home may not have possessed the minimum skills and knowledge necessary to be successful in this environment. Not everyone finds working at home enjoyable. Introverts might, <laughs> extroverts might not. Organizations who purposefully recruit and hire staff for work at home positions know some types of people adapt better than others in this environment. Therefore, they want to identify the reasons people are attracted to work at home and build these characteristics into their recruiting profile. Perhaps those seeking work at home opportunities are incapable or have difficulty traveling to a brick and mortar site or work at home jobs attract those who require a flexible schedule, such as working during the morning, golfing in the afternoon and working again in the evenings. Whatever their motivation, your organization should understand these drivers for employee satisfaction and include these in your sourcing process. When you think about your minimum skills and knowledge lists, these will be different for work at home than they are for brick and mortar. Not every work at home environment is created equal. If you operate in a close to hub model, you typically hire into the site. And once agents are trained and performing at acceptable levels and possess the right attributes, they may be offered to work at home. Staff in this environment can be brought back into the site for additional training or team meetings, um, town halls, and this blends the brick and mortar and work at home environments. 
But in a geographically distributed model, these organizations hire directly into work at home. They conduct all the sourcing, recruiting, and training remotely. Once hired, the staff are then managed remotely. This model offers companies the flexibility of hiring staff across the country and even around the globe, which is helpful during weather or technology related outages. Sourcing candidates for either work at home environment or brick and mortar require the recruiting organization to have a proven sourcing strategy that attracts the type of candidates needed for their positions. You might find that employee referrals uh, provide the best fit candidate because staff have an opportunity to recommend others who they feel would be a good fit for the environment and the company. Through the analysis of successful and unsuccessful staff, one of our clients found that those who were most successful possessed two specific characteristics. One, they commuted within an 11 mile radius. And two, a large percent had attended technical community colleges. Well, armed with that knowledge, the recruiting manager held job fairs at a technical community college about seven miles from the center. This effort paid off as those candidates possessed two characteristics of her most successful agents. And as her consultant, I was really proud of her efforts. She used all of her data to improve her sourcing process. Now, once we have a pool of candidates, they need to be screened to ensure they meet the minimum hiring requirements and the skills and capabilities and characteristics that are required that ensure their success. We worked with a large seasonal company who was struggling with their holiday ramp and they needed our expertise to guide them in identifying the entire recruiting and hiring process. One element of this was to analyze their previous year's batch of new hires to determine the screening thresholds. At the time we engaged with them, they had a battery of tests that all candidates went through, but the results were not considered during the hiring process. That was a little unusual, but honestly, it ended up benefiting us in the end as we had then a wide range of scores we could analyze to determine the best thresholds. And what we found was that agents achieving specific thresholds were more likely to succeed in their role, either performing well or staying with the company or both. And from our analysis, you can see that scoring 65% or better on grammar skills 80% or better on basic PC and navigation skills, and 36 plus months of customer service experience all resulted in lower attrition. And although the organization thought they needed 35 words per minute, the data showed that 20 words per minute resulted in the same average handle time, and they could lower their threshold which then opened them up to a much wider pool of candidates without any degradation in efficiency. So let's move on and talk a little bit about verification. During this process, all the screening requirements are verified before hiring. Then the agent's skills are verified before they get out of the training class. Some organizations have a nesting process and those staff have to actually graduate from nesting into production. At all phases, we should be verifying the skills and knowledge requirements using a quantitative method. Forms of verification could be any one of these that you see here. Could be interviews, verbal tests during interviews, uh, written tests, role plays during training perhaps, uh, transaction monitoring during nesting, and for the organization I mentioned, they used computer simulations prior to hire. And these simulations tested the candidate's ability to listen and talk and type all at the same time. It tested their typing speed and their accuracy. 
and it tested several customer service scenarios. We have created a template which we affectionately call the people matrix. And, uh, and this houses all the recruiting, hiring, training, verification, and even early production data. This tool really is invaluable in conducting all the analysis that's needed to help improve these processes over time. Now this example shows the minimum skills and knowledge which are required at the time of hire. That's the green column. And as you can see, some hiring requirements are also training requirements. So this means we expect candidates to possess these basic skills and aptitudes, but the organization will provide additional training to hone and perfect these skills specific for their operations. All of which would be quantitatively verified for candidates to move forward through this process. Shown here in the green columns, the method for verification and the threshold. Good listening skills are verified during the recruiting interview and the candidate has to achieve at least a four on a five point scale. As we mentioned, you will want to continually review your hiring requirements to see if they are effective and correlated to operational performance. This organization reviewed the overall recruitment rating, that's the center column, against the overall operational rating, that's the far right column, for each of the agents they hired in a certain period of time. And as you can see in the analysis table below, they found two of the 10 agents failing and their action was to review the tests and thresholds. Other analysis showed a strong correlation with a 0.68 between the two ratings, which indicated that the recruitment testing was a really pretty good predictor of operational performance. And they found that sales aptitude had a low correlation with performance so they took action to review the sales aptitude test and determine where the breakdown was. I mentioned the correlation of 0.68, but we wanted to show that it came from this scatter plot. Now, for our example, we only used 10 agents, really just for illustrative purposes, but this analysis should include all of your hires. So how do we recruit? Well, we've talked about some of these already, but we need to ensure our recruiting process is quantitative. And just like we do with transaction monitoring, we want to ensure our recruiters are calibrated. So ask yourselves these questions. Are your recruiters listening and looking for the same requirements during the interviews? Do the recruiters score their interviews in the same way? Do your recruiters know how to pull threads based on responses that they've received from the candidates? And uh, are your recruiters remaining objective in their assessments? Really, no matter the size of your recruiting team, we recommend that you conduct calibration sessions with them to ensure the interview process is done consistently. The interviews should be structured. There should be multiple testing methods. And if your organization allows, let the candidates take a tour or have candidates spend some time with an agent, maybe sitting side by side. It's always great ways to allow candidates to get a feel for the real job. Naturally, this can be done for brick and mortar or close to hub environments. When I worked in a third party space, our candidates were not allowed on the production floor. So we developed as true to life as possible, a video, which we then had showing in our lobby for them to review while they were waiting for their interview time. It's always better to reduce the number of candidates provided to operations to ensure a higher quality of recruit. So please hire only those candidates who meet your proven minimum hiring requirements. The recruiting team should be held accountable to at least two metrics. 
One is the fill rate or on time, which is a percent of staff requests filled by the targeted date. The benchmark for this is 90%. We recommend to our clients that they establish a service level agreement between recruiting and operations that would state the lead times and um, that are needed to fill requests. So for example, if operations provides headcount requirements to recruiting with four or more weeks of lead time, then recruiting measures themselves against the high performance benchmark target of 90%. If however, operations provides them less than four weeks lead time, then recruiting measures themselves against a lower target, maybe say 80%. This is just an example, and these targets could vary based on many different factors. The second measurement for recruiting is uh, recruiting quality. And recruitment quality is a percent of staff who successfully complete the new hire training program and remain in the business for three months. The benchmark for recruitment quality is 80%. The recruiting department is responsible for tracking their performance to these metrics and improving upon these when they're not meeting the target. A best practice that we recommend is a fact-based analysis of successful and unsuccessful hires to improve the recruitment and hiring process. Now, this requires getting a list of the most successful and the least successful agents um, from your operations team, and then analyzing their specific information. This information would include things like hiring requirements and hiring characteristics and uh, information from the application, interview scores, training scores, uh, transaction monitoring results, absenteeism results, and even productivity data. Just like my hiring manager did to determine where to source more people like those she found to be successful. Now, as you saw, recruiting should be responsible for recruitment quality, the percent of staff who stay in the business. Remember what we reviewed, recruiting should find candidates who are skilled and motivated. Motivated means they want to work for your organization. Therefore, they should be tracking the attrition at every touch point. In this example, 71% of the applicants were not hired. This may honestly be a good thing, as it may show that the center was ensuring applicants met their minimum hiring requirements. But the alarming result is that 61% of the agents were lost between the time of hire and the third month on the job. This results in a cost to the organization because we, had, we find that the point at which we've recovered our recruiting and hiring and training costs isn't until typically about month four or five. So recruiting needs to work really hard to ensure they are hiring folks who are motivated to work at the company. This is an example of an organization who tracked the retention of their new hires. And if you would please pay particular attention to month four. In the June class, only 47% of their new hires were still with the organization and only 53% from the August class. Now at this point, we were asked to get involved and help them identify the root causes for this poor performance. The root causes turned out to be um, inconsistent recruiting was one, poor adherence to the minimum hiring requirements was another, and one rogue trainer. They initiated some actions and as you can see, the October and November classes had much better retention at month four which reduced their attrition costs. Now there's two slides I wanna leave you with. I've talked about successful recruiting and hiring practices, but when we think about the employee life cycle, it also encompasses their time in training and their time in operations. 
So think about this. A candidate is hired by recruiting. They then spend time with HR to review the company policies. Uh, they're handed off to training where they spend a week or more with one or two or more trainers. Throughout training, SMEs may pop in to lend their expertise on particular subjects. Then the candidate is handed off to a nesting lead and floor monitors assist with questions and monitoring their progress. From there, they're handed off again to a supervisor and greeted by a team of 15 to 20 other agents. This process is exacerbated by the fact that they may not spend much time with that supervisor before they're reassigned um, to a different supervisor due to maybe shift bids. That whole process can be a bit daunting and a lot of names to remember along the way. So when working with our clients, we strongly encourage them to establish an employee life cycle discussion that includes folks from recruiting, training, nesting, and operations. They get together and they discuss the employee experience and they work together upstream and downstream to improve this entire process for your employees and for your future candidates and the organization as a whole. Lastly, we work with organizations on all aspects of this process. We help identify minimum skills and knowledge requirements. So your candidates have a high success rate in operations. Uh, we advise and conduct the analysis of that successful and unsuccessful staff to determine where correlations exist or not and use that to set thresholds. We consult on how to construct recruitment profiles that result in a more successful candidate. And we work with organizations to identify and reduce their early attrition levels and associated costs. Really wanna thank you all for attending today. And I'm gonna turn it back over to James and see what questions he has for us. Okay, great. Cindy, thank you so much. Uh, it was really well done. And I, I think there's a lo lot of great information that was shared with our attendees today. Um, as mentioned, uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so for, for questions and answers. And we've already had a few come in to the queue. Uh, first one is, do you find that organizations you work with uh, already measure recruiting and quality at the level you discussed here today? Mm. Um, recruitment quality. Uh, Seldom, I would say, um, really because recruiting historically uh, feels they're responsible for bringing in new candidates to fill the headcount requirements, um, and then their job is done. Um, it's really not until they get engaged with us that they learn the importance of retaining those candidates um, that they've hired. So I, I, I would say seldom. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. The next one is, do you find that uh, organizations rely solely on the recruiting team during the hiring process or do other departments get involved? Mm. Okay. Um, I, I would say it's a, a bit of a mixed bag. Some of our clients, uh, recruiting departments pretty much own the entire sourcing and hiring process. Um, while other recruiting departments um, engage staff from other departments. So they might get uh, some folks from production or training or quality to help out, maybe even conducting first or second interviews. Um, if other staff are asked to help, then we would be a huge proponent of saying we need to make sure they're trained on how to um, successfully conduct interviews and make sure they're calibrated right along with the recruiters uh, to ensure consistency of hires. Okay, great. Okay, and then um, you had talked a little bit about um, early attrition. So the question here is why is recruiting responsible for early attrition, AKA recruiting quality? I think you kind of answered that a little bit already. Yeah, we did. Um, okay. It's really because they, um, we want to make sure that they're, when they source candidates, they're thinking about that candidate for the long term. 
And so, um, and that's what recruiting quality is all about is measuring the attrition and how long those folks actually stick in the business. So, um, so recruiting should really have an eye on not only can the people, um, can these candidates be successful in the role uh, from a production perspective, but are they going to stay with us long term? So just as an example, um, we, had, uh, we had a client that we worked with that actually found out that they needed to reduce one of their thresholds in their um, hiring process because what they were doing was they had a, it was a technical threshold that was way too high. And they found out that the people that they hired um, were qualified, but they were overqualified. And so they only stayed for a few months and then they left when they found a, um, a more uh, acceptable position that had that higher technical um, requirement. So, so they actually figured out that they needed to um, reduce their, uh, their threshold. It was Perfect. interesting. Yes. Um, and we've had a flurry of questions come in, but uh, we've got time, I think, for one more. Um, and this has to do with verification. Do you find some verification methods work better than others? Sure. Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, the you didn't really need to be purposeful about the verification methods that you choose. Make sure they're really based on the requirement. So, um, you know, for instance, if the requirement is typing, then naturally you need a typing test. Um, if the requirement is um, good customer service, then you need to determine um, this based on some sort of online test filled with customer service scenarios. Um, supervisors is, is a great example because the most important skill a supervisor needs to have is coaching, sure. but you can't test for coaching. Uh, so in that situation, you would verify their skills, their coaching skills through some sort of observation, right? You need to observe them coaching to really understand whether they um, know how to do that appropriately. Um, or you may want to do some sort of combination of verbal questions and written questions to verify um, similar requirements. So make sure it's really purposeful, your verification methods, well thought out. 